Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in his in the holy scriptures regarding his son who as to his earthly life was a descendant of david and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of god in power by his resurrection from the dead jesus christ our lord through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake and you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God, called to be his holy people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I rem and I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open to me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I may have a harvest among you, just as I've had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I'm eager. I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness, godlessness, and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Though they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of, of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their woman exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the man also abandoned natural relations with woman and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received, and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, and God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. 
although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue, continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So we just finished Romans chapter 1, and after every chapter, we will pray. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. And, Father, I pray that as we read the book of Romans, Lord, I just pray that you would open up your righteousness by faith to us, God. Father, I pray, may the Spirit of God illuminate the Scripture into our hearts, God. Father, we need our hearts to be enlightened, so we ask you for that grace. Father, we know it's not by might and not by power, but it's by your Spirit. So, Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. Would you take the Word of God and change us? Change us, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. May your Spirit be be written upon our hearts, Lord. Though that word, let it be written on our heart, Lord. It's not by law that we are justified, but it's by faith. And Father, reveal to us what you're saying in the book of Romans. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And now we're going to read Romans chapter 2. And Charisma, go ahead. You can, your life. Romans chapter 2. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show content for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, for all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. 
So then if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, I thank you, God, for your word, O oh God. I thank you that your word has the power and the ability to change every person, to transform us and to bring us to the light, O oh God. Father, I pray that we will not be judging others, O oh God. You are the righteous judge. You are the great judge, O oh God, who is sitting on the throne. I pray, O oh God, that you would forgive us if we have judged others in times past, O oh God. I pray, O oh God, that we will be people who are righteous in your sight, taking on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not by the law, O oh God, but by your word, O oh God, doing things that are pleasing by the Spirit of God living inside of us. I pray, O oh God, that you would circumcise our hearts today, O oh God, that you would cut our hearts, that you would transform, mend it, and make it into a heart that pleases you, O oh God, a heart that is soft, a heart that trusts in God. I pray, O oh God, that you would circumcise inwardly, O oh God, by your word, by your truth, by your spirit, that we will produce it outwardly by the fruits that we have, O oh God, Jesus I surrender every single one of us, oh God, I pray that you would do your work inside of us, oh God, that we will repent, that we will take on your righteousness, that we will say yes to your word, oh God, and be your children who follow your instructions. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Amen. We are reading the book of Romans. You can join us on Zoom if you would like to read along with us. Uh, join us on Zoom. You'll be called upon. And right now we're in Romans chapter 3. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness not at all let God be true and every human being a liar as it is written so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge but if our if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly what shall we say that God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us I am using a human argument certainly not if that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim, that we say, let us do evil, that good may result, their condemnation is just. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There's no fear of God before their eyes. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silent and the whole world held ac accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscience 
of our sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires work? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through the same faith, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask you that you would open up the scriptures to us. Father, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you would illuminate this justification by faith, God, that our hearts would grasp this truth deeply, O oh God, that we are not justified by the law, but we are justified by Jesus Christ. And Father, may we not lean upon the arm of the flesh, upon the arm of the law, but lean upon you, Jesus, that your blood has power to save us and to keep us in Jesus' mighty name. Father, our righteousness and our grace comes from you, Lord. Holy Spirit, continue to speak to us through the book of Romans. In Jesus' precious, mighty name, we pray. Charisma, you're live. Go ahead. Romans chapter 4. What then shall mm -hmm. we... Hello, Sorry. Charisma. Praise the Lord. Uh, can I continue with chapter 4? Can I read it? Okay. Are you able to turn your camera on? Yeah, just a second. Just okay. give me one minute. Okay, yeah. Char Charisma will finish this chapter and you can you can read chapter five. Okay. Why then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, <clears throat> but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. To the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness, under what circumstances was it credited? Was it before, after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. 
So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law hears, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abram's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that are not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for those who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Father, I thank you that Jesus died for our sins, O God. And he was resurrected so that we can be made just, righteous, and pure in your eyes. I pray, O oh God, that even Abraham, he believed you, O oh God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. I pray that each one of us, that we will not believe in our good works, our efforts, our strivings, our strength, but we, we will believe in Jesus and that we will have faith in you, O oh God, the finished work that has already been done on behalf of us, O oh God. Lord, I pray that righteousness will be credited to us on behalf of what Jesus did for us, O oh God. Lord, I pray that we will put our absolute trust in you, O oh God. Even if our situation is as dead as Sarah's womb, O oh God, we know that you can birth something new, O oh God. You are the God who births new promises, I pray, O oh God, that we will trust in you fully, O oh God, that we will believe you till the end, O oh God. We will obey you to completion, O oh God, and that we will have faith and through that faith, O oh God, we will take on the righteousness of Jesus, the justification that comes from him, O oh God, that we are made right before God, not by our own works, O oh God. Lord, I pray that you will impart that faith as we are reading the scriptures, O oh God, that faith will begin to arise in our hearts, O oh God, to believe God, to step out, O oh God, and to enter into your throne room by your righteousness, by your work, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. We are reading the book of Romans. We're at Romans chapter 6. And right now the next person, please be ready. Uh, Divya, if you're able to turn your cameras on and on mute, you can read chapter 6. Uh, if you're not ready, I can read chapter 6. Uh, please turn your cameras on. If when you turn your cameras on, I will switch on you. Okay. All right. Okay. She's ready. I'll go ahead on mute. Uh, I think Charisma read chapter five. She read chapter four. Okay. You can read chapter five then. Go ahead. Peace with God through faith. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Death in Adam, life in Christ. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death re reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Lord. For we need you, Lord Jesus, more and more. Lord, we need your grace more and more in our life, Lord. Help us to live the life the way you want us, according to your will, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, I ask this prayer. Amen. Amen, amen. We're in Romans chapter 6. If you'd like to join in the reading of the Word of God, you can join us on Zoom, and you can be a partaker of that grace of reading the Word of God. I'll be reading Romans chapter 6, and then the next person will be reading thank you for everyone that is participating and right now we're in romans chapter six what shall we say then shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase by no means we are those who have died to sin how can we how can we live in it any longer or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into christ jesus were were baptized into his death we were, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For we have been united with him in a death like, this, like his. We will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. 
that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace." What then shall we shall we sin because we are not under the law but under the grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you're slaves to sin, whether le which leads to death, or to or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. By th but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin. You have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity, to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your spirit, for your word. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that Jesus, you came and you died and you took our place and we are dead to sin in you, O oh God. Father, I thank you, Father God, that we are justified by faith. We're not justified by the law. And we're kept by grace, not by the law, but, but through faith in you. Holy Spirit, I pray, let this deep revelation be grounded deeply in our heart so that we don't lean upon the arm of the flesh, so that we don't lean upon the arm of the law, but we lean upon your spirit, that we lean upon your blood, and we lean upon your cross, and we lean upon your righteousness. Father, I pray that we don't lean upon our righteousness, but upon yours, oh God. So Father, I pray that you would strengthen us, teach us, and guide us. Holy Spirit, we lean upon you, oh God. Teach us, Lord, as we read this, the, this word. I pray, speak to us by your Spirit. We need your grace. We pray that in Jesus' precious, mighty name. Amen. And Sandra, go ahead. You Amen. can read the next chapter. Yes, chapter 7. Oh, do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is blinding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while, she, while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has being raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, 
our sinful passions aroused by the law, we were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yes, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what is to cover if the law had not said, you shall not co covenant. But sin says there's an opportunity through the commandment produce in me all kinds of covenants. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be dead to me. For sin sees me an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and the righteous and, and, and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring that to me by no means. It was sin producing death in me through what, what was this good in order that sin might be shown in the sin to be sin. And through the commandment, com commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know what the law is spiritual, but I'm on the flesh. I am of the flesh, soul under sin. For I do not understand, I do not, nor understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but no the ability to carry out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do do not want and is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is not longer. I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of the God of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law wagging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks, to be, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God within my mind, but with but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Father, we, we thank you because we recognize our inability, our lack of capacity to do good. We recognize, Lord, that the law has been given us to us to recognize that we are incapable to produce good in us. But you, by your mercy, Lord, has given us this law that is holy 
to to show who you are too, because it's through your character of holiness that we know, Lord, that we are sinners. But thank you, Lord, because of the grace it is given through Jesus Christ that we can fight this battle in the spirit, Lord, not in our flesh, because we know our flesh tends to do evil. Lord, we ask you for the grace to fight this battle in our in our members, Lord, that tends to do what we don't want. Because as our Lord and Savior said, our, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. We ask you, Father, to strengthen us in your grace and strengthen us in your spirit in the mighty name of Jesus and strengthen us Lord in our minds renewing our minds in what is good Lord thank you for showing us who we are Lord but also giving us the opportunity to come together and be one with you through Christ Thank you. We, we, we thank you, Lord. And we pray for those who in this moment are struggling with temptations, with addictions, with their own members, Lord, in his own body and in their own mind, that you will deliver them in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We're in Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do so, God, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful sinful flesh to be a sin offering and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit those who live according to the flesh have their have their mind set on what the flesh desires but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to, to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed for the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that cre that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth 
right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say and respond to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but, ra but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also along with Him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Thank you, Jesus. Who shall separate us, separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake we face de death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor this present nor the, nor the present nor the future nor any powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice that through you, Father, we are justified. That through the blood of Jesus, we are sanctified. We are justified and we anchor ourselves in that. We anchor ourselves in the blood of Christ. We anchor ourselves in justification by faith. Father, we know that the law only reveals that there's, there's a sin nature and that is put to death by Jesus on that cross. Father, we thank you, Father God. We thank you for Jesus, Lord. We don't lean upon the arm of the flesh. We don't lean upon the arm of the law, but we lean upon the arm of Jesus, upon the blood of Jesus and upon the Spirit of God. And we thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for your love and that nothing will separate us from your love. And Father, we anchor ourselves that by faith we are justified, we may are made righteous, and by faith we are kept righteous in Jesus' name. Father, you are our anchor. You are our anchor. We love you. We thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your word. Continue, continue, continue to reveal to us the word of God. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Charisma, you can read chapter, next chapter. Chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah who is God over all forever praised, amen. It is not as though God's word had failed for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they're his descendants are they all Abraham's children. 
On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, why then does God still blame us for who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay, some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah had previously said, Unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. What then shall we say that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursue the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Father, we come before you, O oh God, and I just pray that we will place our trust in you, O oh God. As we place our trust in you, we believe, as the word says, we will not be put to shame, O oh God. Lord, I pray that we will not place our identity in our own selves, the works that we do, the abilities that we have, the things that we are able to achieve. But we will place it upon Jesus who speaks over us, who says to us, oh God, that he will have mercy on us, that he would call us his children, that we would be his loved ones. I pray, oh God, that you would impart that faith inside of us, oh God, to believe in Jesus and not by your works, oh God. Just as the Jewish people did not receive righteousness by works, but by faith, I pray, oh God, we will receive it by faith, oh God. Lord, I pray. 
as you said, as the potter is able to make whatever he wants to make, oh God, I pray that we will submit to your will, that whatever you want to do through us, that we will say yes to you, oh God. Lord, that we will not resist what you are doing, that we will not talk back to what you are saying, oh God, but we will obey you, we will submit to you, we will surrender to you. We are just clay. You are the potter, oh God. Shape us, form us in the way you want us to be made, oh God. Lord, we surrender ourselves into you your hands, oh God. Form each one of us, oh God, to your glory for your purposes, oh God. Use us for your works, oh God, that we will not be led by the flesh, oh God, or by our self-will, but we would be led by your spirit and by your will. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. We are in Romans chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelite Israelites is that they may be saved for i can testify about them that they are zealous for god but their zeal is not based on knowledge since they did not know the righteousness of god and sought to establish they, their own they did not submit to god's righteousness christ is the is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law, the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and this is where the sinner's prayers come by declaring. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your, ma with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. Thank you, Jesus. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask. Did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. And I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people father i pray god that we don't lean upon the arm of the flesh and try to be justified by the law father i pray god that 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 justif justification by faith will be deep in every single person god father i pray god i pray god just as the children of israel tried to be holy and righteous in their own strength and they fell short because they did it by the law and the law is only a school teacher that reveals that it, we must come to Christ. We must believe. And grace is imparted through faith. Father, we turn our hearts to you. We call upon you. We say that the blood of Jesus 
is our portion, that the cross is our portion, and everything that Jesus did on the cross, He did it for us. And we believe, we declare, we declare that Jesus is, is our righteousness. We declare that the blood of Jesus has not lost power. We declare that our justification is by faith and and Jesus gives it to us freely because we believe, we believe that he died for us and, and he rose again for us. So Father, I thank you. May this be imparted in each person's heart. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I ask then, has God rejected these people? By no means, for I myself, I'm, I am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed you prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone, I am left. And they seek my life. But what is God's re reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bound the knee to bow. So two are the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it, by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace will no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it by the rest were hardened as is written. God gave them a spear of stupor, eyes that will not see and ears that will not hear down to his very day. Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and being their backs forever. So I ask, did they assemble in order that they might fall by no means rather through their trespass salvation has come has come to the gentiles so as to make israel jealous now if the trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the gentiles how much more with their full inclusion mean. Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles in Amush. Then I'm, as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to show, to show, to somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and to save some of them for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will the acceptance means but their but life from the dead? In the offerings as first fruits of holy, so the whole lump and it is the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although I will, a wild olive shoot were grafted in among others and now share in the nurturing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it's not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For 
if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will spare you. Note that the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provide you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will to be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in the unbelief, if they do not continue in the, their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off, what is by nature a wall of the tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be regretted back in their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And this way, all Israel shall be saved as is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And these will be covenant with them. I'll take away their sins. As regard of the gospel, they are enemies for the sake. But as regard of election, they are beloved for the sake of their own forefathers for the gifts and the calling of god are irrevocable for just as you were in, at one time disobedient to god but now have received mercy because of the, their disobedience so they too have known being disobedient in order that they, they have mercy showing to them today i also know receive mercy for God has consigned all of this obedience that they may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable in his judgments and how un unscrut unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been in his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he may be repaid? For, for who, for, from him and through him and not him all things to him forever and ever. For him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I was really trying to understand so much richness, Lord, that your mercy, that you had crafted us back to the root and the original olive, that we didn't, we didn't belong there, Lord, but in your mercy, in your eternal love, you decide to put us in that tree, Lord, and help us to to walk with fear and trembling and being appreciated, Lord, of the salvation that we have in Christ, Lord, that those promises that you once gave it to, to your people, now they are, are ours, belong to us, Lord. And we pray for, for your people, Lord, for those who had stumbled in the rock, that they can like you said, Lord, it is your will for them to repent and believe in your living and your living sacrifice to Jesus, Lord. They, they, they believe that he is the Messiah that they, they've been waiting for, Lord, that you already sent your son to die for them, Lord. Thank you for, for this wonderful gift for all us as a Gentiles are born now for your family and your family being adopted. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in, a, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fer fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will burn, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the instructions you've given us, God. I pray that our love would be genuine. I pray that the gifts you've given us, that we would use it, God, by faith. Father, I pray that we would not become conceited or proudful, Father God. I pray that we would always be anchored in you, always drawing from the source, God. Always be led by your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you, Father God. I pray that you would continue to lead us and to guide us, Lord. We love you. We worship you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Go ahead, Charisma. You can read the next chapter. Chapter 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal. You shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, 
are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put, put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in decession and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, I pray, O oh God, and I thank you for every authority, every leader you have placed over our lives, be it the one who rules the nation, who rules the church, or is over the family, O oh God. I pray, O oh God, that each one of us, we will submit to our authorities because they have been assigned and appointed by you, O oh God, that we will respect them and give honor where honor is necessary, O oh God. Lord, I pray that you would keep every authority in your word by your spirit, O oh God, that they will be good stewards of what you have given them, the power and the influence, O oh God, that they would do good to people, O oh God. I pray that you would help every leader, O oh God, to walk in your ways, to be blameless in your sight. I pray, O oh God, that each one of us, that we will carry a heart to love one another, to love our neighbors, to seek for their best interests, O oh God. We know that all of the law, it is summed up in this command, O oh God. Jesus, you first loved us. May that love overflow inside of us to others, O oh God. Let people experience the love of God through our lives, through the words we speak, through the actions that we do, O oh God. May your love flow through us to others, O oh God. Lord, I pray that you would fill us, O oh God. May we experience the depthness of your love, the deep love that you have toward each one of us. I pray, O oh God, that we would be carriers of you, of your presence, of your love, of your power, O oh God. Lord, may we have faith to believe you for more, O oh God. We know that it is not by works, but by your spirit. Holy Spirit, lead each one of us, O oh God, in the right direction. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Romans chapter 14, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows him to eat anything, but another's whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master's servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each one of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead of make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. 
Therefore, do not let what you know is good to be spoken as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whether you believe about these things, keep, keep between yourself and God. Blesses the one who does not who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith, and everything, that's, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Father, in Jesus' name, we just ask you, Lord, that you keep us in faith, God. Father, I pray that you keep us in the love of God. You keep us in the mercy of God. You keep us in the, in the righteousness of God. Preserve us in you, O God, in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I ask you, I ask you, Holy Spirit, that, that you would reveal more of you to us, O God. I pray that the kingdom of God is inside of us, that peace, righteousness, and joy is inside of each person, O God. Father, I pray that you would be richly inside of us, O oh God. Lord, and we love you and we thank you for your word. And we give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' precious, mighty name, we pray. Amen. Chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, the example of Christ. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God, Christ the hope of Jews and Gentiles. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order to the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with this people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Yeshaya says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Paul, the minister to the Gentiles, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Irkim, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. 
and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in this regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to spend Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you. Once I have enjoyed your company for a while, at present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints for Macedonia and Acacia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of a service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come into the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for leading us in the way we should go, Lord. Lord, as you have the will for us, that where should we go? That we should be, that we will be at the right place at the right time, Lord, according to your will. Yes, Lord. Help us, give us that discernment, Lord, as you have given to the poor. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your mighty name, Abba Father, I ask this prayer. Amen. Man, we're on Romans chapter 16. This is the last chapter, and we're gonna it's gonna be concluded with the book of Romans. I commend to our I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sensiria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and, and to give her any help she may need from you, for she have for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risk their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also, greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Epen, Epen, Epenitus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Aunt Andrinicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Amphiliatus, my dear friend in, in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Syntychus. Greet Apelles, who whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Her Herodian. My fellow Jew, greet those in the house of ne who are in the Lord. Greet Tyrephans and Tarosa, <laughs> those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Greet Anasitis, Philegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters with them. Greet. Philijus, Julia, Nurses, and his sister Olympias, and all the Lord's people who are with them greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. Greetings. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flat flattery they deceive the minds of na naive people anyone 
Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Timothy, my co-worker, sends his greetings to you as those Lucius, Jason, and Sosiphopar, my fellow Jews. I, Tertus, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you greetings. Ephesus, who is the city's director is of public works, and our brother Quartus sends you their greeting now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden, hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes through comes from faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we just thank you for the book of Romans. And Father, we give you glory, we give you worship, and we give you praise. Lord, to you be all the glory, to you be all the praise. Father, we thank you that that in that book, Lord, you taught us to be justified by faith and, and we must do our part. We must believe in Jesus. We must put our faith in him. We must believe in his blood, believe in the cross and not lean upon the arm of the flesh, not lean upon the arm of the law. For the law only reveals that we have a problem and that solution is in Jesus and in the Spirit of God and in the grace of God. So, Father, we anchor ourselves in you. Father, we anchor ourselves in the blood of Jesus. We anchor ourselves in the justification that comes by Jesus. So, Father, I thank you for this word. Lord, I know, Lord, that, that it took the men and women of God, they suffered a lot to receive these revelations, and they brought it to us, God. I pray that it would be deep in everyone's heart, justification by faith and kept by faith. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in the cross of Jesus, and we believe in the justification and kept in the grace of God by faith in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we read through all the book of Romans. And re remember, Romans is a book on the justification by faith. Remember, don't lean on the arm of the flesh. Don't lean on the law. The law only reveals that we need help. That is Jesus. That is the blood of Jesus. That is the grace of God. And so... Thank you for being with us right now. We're going to watch a short testimonies. Also, if you'd like to give or sow into the stream, you can do that. Feel free. Remember, right after we are continuing Zoom for ministry, for prayer, and however God will lead us in that direction. So those people that are on Zoom, please stay. We're going to continue on with 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 praying and, and that. And so... If God has laid anything on your heart to support the stream, you could do so. And right now, you can watch these testimonies, and we're going to come back. And we're going to be on Zoom for ministry. So here we go. Hey, guys. My name is Julia Kili Molly, and I'm going to share a bit of my testimony with you in hopes that it will strengthen your faith and give you some encouragement. So about two years ago, I was living in Grand Island, Nebraska. And I decided that I wanted to go to the mall in Omaha with a couple of my friends. On the way there, I got there safely, but on the way back, we were involved in a really serious car accident and it left me in really bad shape. I wasn't able to feel my body from the neck down. I wasn't able to move. The only thing that I could move was my neck. My jaw was completely locked. I wasn't able to eat foods. I had to take food through a tube in my nose or get food that was pureed through a straw on the side of my mouth. I was in the hospital in and out for some time, and then I was in the hospital consistently from three, for three months. And after that, I was brought into a nursing home to receive rehabilitation, so physical therapy daily, and just be watched 24 seven. I was in there for some time, and then after that, my family brought me to Maryland. And while I was in Maryland, my sister's husband's 
brother-in-law told my family about a conference called Race to Deliver that is going to be that was to be held in Washington. And my dad wanted to take me and I also wanted to go. So to get there, because I couldn't walk and I couldn't feel my body, my dad wanted to get me a wheelchair, but I didn't want him to get me a wheelchair. I didn't want him to bring in a wheelchair into the house and say, Julia, this is your wheelchair. I didn't want that wheelchair to come in and him to buy it with a purpose, with that in mind of this is my daughter's, I'm buying this for Julia. I didn't want to own that, that wheelchair was mine. I didn't want to own that I couldn't feel, that I couldn't do anything for myself. I didn't want to own that. I just knew that there was, that there was more. I, I knew that, that this couldn't have been the end. So I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And my dad didn't know how he was going to get me to the conference. So my dad went out and he rented a wheelchair. And he brought the wheelchair in the house and told me that he rented it. And then after that, we went to the Race to Deliver conference. And on the second day, God healed me completely. And I was able to do everything that I could do before the car accident. My jaw was no longer locked. I was able to walk, I was able to feel, I was able to do everything that I could do before the car accident. I have some pictures for you guys that I want to show you. Here is a picture of me when I was in the hospital. And here's a picture of me when I was in the nursing home. That's my mother that's reading the Bible to me. I hope that this encourages you guys and that it strengthens your faith. I was diagnosed with, I don't like to say, with my knee. Um, and it's been so stiff. And when I go uh, downstairs, it's like, <sighs> oh, it's been around 10 years. And so they prayed and they prayed again and again and again and again. And a lot of um, heat was coming into both of my knees. They're praying a lot of heat, a lot of heat. And come on, come on. It's great. My name's Michelle Burt. Uh, I'm from Pasco, Washington. I had severe back pain in my lower back. Um, doctors told me that my cartilage was gone and needed to regrow, and I had to get injections for it. Um, as of right now, I have no pain. As uh, I had my hands on my back, I literally felt moving. I felt things were growing, things being realigned, and I'm just thankful to God for it. And all, all your pain is gone? All my pain is gone. How much did you have? I, it was a seven. Awesome. It was a seven. Thank you so much. It, it kept me from working, and now I feel like I could do cartwheels. T so. t t t do something what you couldn't do. No pain? No pain. Awesome. No pain. <laughs> Tell us where you're watching us from. Hi, um, I am watching from Spokane, Washington. Spokane, Not Washington. that far. <laughs> Come on, that's about two hours away from us. And can yeah. you tell us what was the problem you had? So, um, I like have a really, I had real bad vision. For yeah. instance, I would work at McDonald's and I'd be like reading the screens and I'd misread things like McChicken and it was supposed to be a McDouble and all this kind of stuff. Um, it was almost like uh, I need glasses for everything because it was really, really fuzzy. And now it's like I'm seeing everything. It really? Clear HD. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, it's you really had cool. you had problems seeing far or problems seeing close? Um, I. It's mostly far. Yeah, mostly far. Uh, as I got older, though, I do notice that um, I was even having problems seeing close things too. So wow. the older I get. The older I got, the worse it got, for sure. And so, before you joined Zoom, can you tell us a little bit about your vision? How was it before you joined Zoom? My vision before I, um, it, I don't know. It's like everything was fuzzy, like Bible wording. Like, you know, I, I could read it, I could see it, but it was like very, very fuzzy. I had to really super focus in on it. And now I'm looking at it, um, you know, distance away, and it's just crystal clear. It's wow. like um, it's like watching like you know those old TVs. You know wow. how uh, with like the box in the back. It, that's what it was like before, and now it's like watching something with HD. Wow. If that makes sense. 
Wow, we yes. give God the glory. Come on. If you want God to wash away your sins, put your hand on your heart, and I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. The Bible says, if we confess with our mouth, and we believe in our heart, we shall be saved. You already heard the good news. The good news is Jesus died. Now you simply believe it, and you confess it, and it gives it to you. It's so simple. And it's so easy. And if that is your heart's desire, put your hand on your heart and repeat after me. It's very important that you confess it. Because faith, because faith is in our hearts, but it's confessed with our mouth. So with your hand on your heart, I want you to repeat after me. I want you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. This is a moment between you and God. This is not a moment between you and your neighbor. Between you and God. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus. I ask you. I ask you forgive me for all my sins wash with your precious blood I open the door of my heart. I ask you to come inside. Forgive me. Save me. Heal me. Deliver me. And help me in this life. I put my trust in you. Amen. And right now, we're just going to pray for you. We're just going to pray for you. Everyone, let's pray for our team. Hey man, that last part was in Ethiopia. Uh, we went into like this Muslim place, uh, gave out the humanitarian aid, uh, did a, a breakout session with a little a little healing, prayed for healing, and then did a little gospel message. And, and all those people were giving their life to Jesus, and then we prayed over them. And so we give God all the glory. And thank you for your partnership, for your one time or your monthly or your support in prayer and in financial support. Thank you so much. Right now we're gonna to transition to Zoom. If you would like prayer, uh, to receive prayer, you can join us on Zoom. And right now we're gonna end this stream and we're just gonna to transition to Zoom. Thank you for watching. I hope you were blessed when we spent time in the book of Romans. God bless you. Remember, don't lean upon the strength of the flesh and don't lean on the law because the law only reveals that we have a problem. Our solution is Jesus. Our solution is the blood. Our solution is the cross of Christ. And our solution is the grace of God, the Spirit of God. Don't lean on the arm of the flesh. The children of Israel tried to do that. They couldn't. They couldn't. Some got hardened. They tried to keep the law for so, so many years. It only reveals we have a problem. And it's by faith in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Till next time.